Jasmine, you're not going to do anything weird and embarrassing, but we've forgotten to do that for so many talks yes. that I apologise. No. I apologise for interrupting. And, and now he's he's broken my flow, so I don't know where I am or what's happening. I'm do, lying. Okay. Do you, no, do you want <laughs> to do the first from... bit snappily? Sorry to redo this, but okay. otherwise we'll only get complaints. Prima donna. I'm trying to get everything right. Okay. Take two. Okay. Take two. Okay. So you've taken my mouse again. Um, so we're going to on to why bother recording once you've got it going. Hmm. We're still moving. Have you broken it? Steve's still moving. So it's the slideshow that's stuck. I think the slideshow is having a rest. Oh. I cannot get the staff. <laughs> we'll be with you in a moment, honestly. It, it'll. <laughs> Ah, have we got one already running in the background? We have. That that's that's the thing. We've tried to share the notes and not the presentation, ah. which which may seem completely reasonable, but okay. Uh, Can everybody see some seagrass on some sand? Can anyone see that? Yes. Thank you. I am embarrassed for you, not for me. I've let I've let you down. <laughs> I've let myself down. But most of all, I've let other people down. Okay. Can I have the mouse, or are you going to click on? Okay. You can have the mouse. Okay. So why bother recording seaweeds? We all wonder. I'm just going to read the whole thing again. Seaweeds should make up most of your species list on a shallow site. And the false boundary between plants and animals isn't nearly as fixed as you've been led to believe. If it helps, think of them as sessile animals with a mobile part of the life cycle that you just don't see very often, just like squirts, bryozoans and hydroids. I was going to have a diagram up for this part showing a typical seaweed life cycle, thank God I did not. But I couldn't find one with horizontal complex. Seaweed weeds generally exist in alternating generations that look identical to each other or so very different that each was classified as a different species until very recently. Generation five of twelve eggs into the that swim around looking for each other, and other biotype spores, which are tiny, ready made versions of the first one. Don't tell me that. What are you doing with my mouse now? I was letting some in. Okay, so <clears throat> the first reason for our usual seaweeds is they really help me sort out biotopes you see such form. And biotopes are a way of describing the habitat and the important species you see in a nice compact manner, but all the other people having the full understand. Thank you. So I tried to design every seed search form with at least one biotope, defined by the seed bed present, the energy of the site, and the energy species present. In this case, I've got the wrong swimmers, and if you just sit down, just tick box down well, all I go to say do the first SS, which is subsediment, which could mean absolutely anything. If you then said there was lots of seaweed present, I could add a second part of the stream, which is which is dominated by macrophytes, which is any love on in all your water. If you then tell me seagrass, I can thin it right down to a subsedimental little grass bed, which is very, very specific and accurate, and what people handling the data really love. Obviously, if you had a more complicated diet, sort of wall, lots of different seaweeds and kelp and things, I'd be one incredibly boring of this, but I've got a seaweed to describe. And while here, I will quickly make it to a grass because seagrass is not weed, it's a vascular plant that flowers and has water for some time. Which is in the UK currently. The first one, Zosterina, is the one that is entirely underwater, pretty much all of the time. And then the other one is Zosterina Nolkei, which lives intertidally, generally quite high up the beach. And really, that's all I'm going to tell you about. They're really fashionable and there are courses and things to do. It's important to call it a if you see it underwater. So, the information I have on what to site then, and the more you know about how much of each thing you saw, the more accurate I can be. So, the diagram, which everybody hates doing, is that actually one of the more important parts of the visit tells me what you saw and where you saw it, and how many people are if you put that you saw sand on the sand or something. So in this case, I just want a mini rubbish drawing, which shows a fairly idealised thing. And the most important thing to put out are that I've described different kinds of plants. So there's all the forest pillars, and then the park halfway down. And I'm saying I've divided the different things up so you can get on the site, and put out the mid-beds on the kelp and on the others. So there's a mill bed in sediment, which is 50% alive. So I know that's live mill when I come to write up, not just part of it, gravel. And then that's mentioned again in a digital box. And then at the bottom of the page, the seeds are important to me. I've listed the first in the, in the ID list. So I've done everything that was seen and done a special box for the mail because I didn't have one. And I've listed all the main things I saw most of, and then down at the bottom put in a couple of seaweeds that I recognise as species. So the seaweeds were common, but sea beach was not. We come a local expert. We are being local experts at that museum with people now mostly retired. So before you learn to realise and become familiar with the more things you'll learn to see. So photos are great. You can get into a few of those. You have a photo and a quick description of where you were. People can generally get you down to two or three possibilities, if not the actual species that you saw. There's a great bunch of people on there and they try really hard to help you. 
you may find that you've expanded the known range for something or be the first to spot an invasive nipping out of arena and into the open sea and people get very excited about that and like nudibranch specialists with thousands of not many people know more than you can go to the your area once you've work, worked out a few that you can identify so we'll talk about how to photograph collect and press seaweeds at the end of this so if you've really had enough by the end of the id section you can just nip off quietly and we'll never notice Okay, so just quickly, we're going to go through the main components of seaweeds so that you have a vague idea of what I'm talking about if I slip into sort of technical terms. So fairly obviously, like a land plant, some of the seaweeds have a mid rib and side veins. Most of them don't. Um, and then the main pieces are the hold fast where the seaweed attaches to the the substrate, the stipe, which is like a stalk, and the blade, which is the main leafy part. Fairly easy. And here's the same thing again on a different kind of seaweed, so you get a vague idea. Hold fast at the bottom, the stipe is the stalk, and this is a big piece of kelp on the right, and then the leafy bits are the blade. Okay, and we're on to identifying easy seaweeds. So this is a nice picture of an entry into a Scottish lock with the seaweeds just waiting to welcome you and break your legs. So we're going to start with the brown seaweeds, which are the first ones you tend to meet as you make your way down into the water, and starting with racks. Uh, technical term for those is fucoids. Um, so the picture on the left here has two different kinds of rack. Anybody want to turn themselves back on and shout out which ones they are? Ooh, a deafening silence. Well, I think oh, no. Serrated rack and egg rack. Yay. No, it's not egg rack, it's bladder rack. Oh. Oh. <laughs> but you got the first one. Popped in in time for a slap. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry? I always didn't mind getting things wrong. <laughs> well, see, we're here to learn and now I get to teach you something. <laughs> And Rob's looking at me because he knows I'm smug. Okay, so the first one that you meet at the top of the beach is channel rack, Pelvicia caniculata. And that's a nice picture of it on the right. You can see, so it's the highest species on the beach. You'll only ever see it on a dive if you're diving on a pretty high tide. Um, but you will trip over it on your way down, I can guarantee. It has blades like a gutter shape, so they're inrolled from the edges. And it needs to spend time out of the water, which is why it's so high up the beach. If it spends more than six hours submerged, it actually starts to drown. It's become that specialised. And on this second picture, the bits towards the top left, those are its... Um, reproductive parts. Yes, that's a polite way of putting it. Those are its reproductive parts. They look a bit like bladders, but they're actually full of sexy stuff. So if you were to squash one, it's full of gel rather than gas. There, it's that quick. Um, the next one you'll come across is spiral rack, Fucus spiralis. Again, this is at the very top of the beach. So only seen on high tide dives or intertidally if you're walking around. The blades are shaped in a loose spiral. So on this second one, you can just about see that the blades are gently twisting. And you can see this most obviously if you pick up a cobble or a boulder that's got it on and just hang it upside down and it won't straighten itself out it hangs in a spiral it does again doesn't have any bladders because it spends hardly any time underwater all of these funny jelly blobs are again reproductive organs some of the the racks up on the beach can hybridize with each other so if you get one that just doesn't have any of the reproductive organs or other features like the serrated edges or mid ribs you probably have to just stick a fucoid or fucus species because you're not going to be able to do it um, either it's one that hasn't grown any features yet or it's a weird hybrid place and flounders do this too it's really annoying next one down serrated rack fucus serratus nice and easy to remember 
it's uh, around the low water mark so you'll see it on all dives it's got a nice strong midrib serrated edges to the blade which is the leafy part <clears throat> and it grows to about a meter long that would be a big one and then below that my favorite egg rack ascophyllum nodosum so you can see this is quite similar similar to the bladder rack and it grows low watermark to shallow subtidal up to two meters high and you really know about that when you're trying to come back in and it wraps around your legs it may live for 15 years it grows very slowly and there's generally a year between each of the single bladders Um, it has a, an odd version called Ecad Macaei, which grows in very, very sheltered lockheads. I'm only telling you this for information. I don't expect you to ever, uh, to, at this time, to be able to work out what it was, because it's really annoying. It has, um, the Macaei has no bladders and it doesn't attach. It just lies in big floating mats that go up and down with the tide and just looks like random bits of rack that you'd never be able to tell apart. Very occasionally this egg rack does the reproductive stuff and it has these weird lollipops, so bladders on stalks poking out of the main stems. So that's a thing to look out for. Am I going too fast? <laughs> I think you're doing fine. Okay. Another thing that's interesting about it is that it hosts a particular red seaweed called vertebrata lanosa and here we can see it out of the water and in the water floating free and it also has a very nice little hydroid clava multicornis so if when you're coming back in doing your safety stop hang around amongst this and you can find these tiny little things they're like very small tubularia very very cute And here's the bladder rack, Fucus basiculosus. Has a visible midrib again, and it has paired bladders instead of single ones interrupting the stem. It's got paired ones either side of the midrib. Mostly subtidal. It's full of permanent bladders, so it doesn't really like to be out of the water for any length of time. It can't survive very well. In brackish, very sheltered conditions, it, I've called it wasted, you'll just get the bladders with a very thin string between rather than a whole blade. It's like it doesn't need it anymore. And if you're in a very exposed area like St Abs, then you may not see this at all because the version of it that exists there is very, very stunted and won't have any bladders. So it'll just be a little brown strip. Already we're on to other brown seaweeds. And we could intervene here and say, I quickly had a pic look for a picture of George Brown, <laughs> but I couldn't find him. So we just used one of seaweeds. <laughs> that would have been brilliant. Three people would have got it. Mm. <laughs> okay. So podweed, Halidris silicosa. This is a kind of rack, but it's so atypical. It's better to put it separately here. So you can see it's like a big 2D Lego tree. It has a quite a, a stout main trunk coming out of its hold fast and then it has this mass of branches which tend to sit facing on to currents so it a bit like a sea fan it gets very wide and, and thin not so wide and flat I suppose mm. yeah. yeah like a 2d tree they yes. understand <laughs> uh, can be found in deeper rock pools but mainly subtidal and instead of bladders, it has these pods at the blade tips. So some of those are air bladders and some of them are reproductive. They look identical, but they're quite fun. They look like pea pods. And this again often hosts a variety of hydroids and the nudibranchs that feed on them. Often the very, very tiny nudibranchs that nobody else can see. So if you spend a bit of time here, you'll see some rare and unusual things. I just confirm is this the, the brown sea oak as well? Yes, that's the other common name. I didn't use it because I don't want people using it on their forms because it just confuses everyone. 
but yes, you're right. Yeah, it's the much less oaky of the two yes. oaks. I, I can't see why it's called sea oak. I, there is just no obvious reason for it. Calm down. <laughs> okay, our next next shallow brown, Japanese wireweed. This is an alien invasive, Sargassum muticum. It does come from Japan and it's spread out from various marinas and things around the country. It's entirely subtidal and you can see it gets absolutely massive. And what it does is it grows up from the bottom to the water surface and then it just lays across the surface and keeps spreading out. So it just blankets out the light from anything below. Here's a close up view and you can see it's got lots of very tiny bladders, which is what allows it to just hang in the water like a massive curtain. I did have somebody put this down on a former's egg rack once and it took me ages to work out what had happened. Okay, another nice shallow brown, mermaid's tresses, cordophyllum. So these are single hollow tubes up to about 50 centimeters long and they don't have bladders but they produce gas within their tissues that migrates to the top of the tube and holds them upright. They often grow in clumps, but here you can see they're just being sad individuals hanging in the water. And they need a sheltered site and they grow in sediment. They never grow on rock. And you see with these ones here, they've collected tons of filth. The individual tubes are covered in tiny fine hairs which just collect bits of fluff and dust out of the water and then other things start to grow on them and weigh them down. And they're very very fragile. You swim across the, the top ends of them they'll just dissolve into the water. Their growing point is a bit further back down the tube and so they're constantly somebody oh I get them um, they're constantly sort of rotting from the ends. And then in contrast to that, here's another plant that looks remarkably similar from any kind of distance. And this is thongweed, Hemanthalia elongata. You see, it's quite a big, tough looking thing in comparison. They're paired solid cords rather than tubes, really quite strong. And they grow from, you can see these buttons. This is actually the plant and the, the tall paired solid lumps are actually their reproductive system. So the buttons can last for about five years and then presumably they've built up enough energy and they send up these enormous long things which only last for a season and then the whole plant dies. Are those buttons unique to that plant, to that algae? Certainly in this country, I don't know of any others that do it in the UK, but there's a couple of tropical ones who do something similar. Cool, but if, if we see those buttons, it's that. Yes, absolutely, definitely. And the hold fast is below the button, so it's joined onto the rock and then the button sits about a centimetre above it. And this grows on bedrock and boulders, not sediment. So that's another difference to look out for if you're not sure. And it can take a bit more exposure and it really enjoys strong currents because it it prefers to be clean. It doesn't like to be covered in gunk because these are the reproductive bits, so it needs to be free to throw things out into the water. And we're on to kelps. That was easy, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, telling kelps apart is a thing I have trouble with. I can't keep all the different kinds in my head at one time, so I do need to remember the differences. So our first one, orweed. Laminaria digitata. This tends to be the one that you find most shallow and because of that it's got a few features. So the stipe, which is the stalk, is very smooth, parallel sided and oval in cross section. So it isn't perfectly round, it's a bit flattened. It doesn't have any passengers. You can see these stipes are almost clean because it, it's quite slippery and smooth, things can't get a grip on it, so there's nothing to weigh it down. 
and the stipe is very very flexible because the thing's almost intertidal and so on at very low tides the whole weight of the plant flops over and if it wasn't flexible then the stipe would snap and it would lose its top and it has a blade like a palm with fingers which is why it's called digitata like a, a hand with fingers it's not going to help you much later but it might help you remember this one now and it it likes to live on reef tops in any level of exposure um, the more sheltered it is the more elaborate and ridiculous the blade becomes so it gets massive and sort of very thin and fragile whereas in a more racy area it's quite thick and leathery and then in comparison with that we have the next one down qv or forest kelp laminaria hyperborea so on this one the stipe is rough to the touch it tapers from the bottom to the top and it's it's full of life because it's rough things can get a grip really nicely oh i forgot to say and it is completely round in cross section and because this never really gets out of the water it doesn't need to be able to flex so although the stem is very strong if you need to pull on it to save yourself on a dive if you bend it it will snap cleanly really quite easily and plenty of plant and animals hangers on so loads of red algae on this one and this one's got a crab clinging onto it often lots of bryozoans and hydroids and squirts as well so those are the two that look the most similar to each other and those are the ways to tell them apart this one again reef tops and slopes in any exposure down to about 30 meters where it's reasonably clear and it'll generally start out as a forest often just below the laminaria digitata uh, but they're not always both present and it'll gradually thin out to park before it sort of disappears altogether at depth can live for 15 years and it grows a new blade every year so the, the stem remains and it just pushes out a new blade and chucks away the old one in the spring which i quite like Again, the blade is like a palm with fingers, but it can be a solid sheet when it's in very sheltered conditions. That's called cape form. And sort of the fingers almost fuse together. So it just becomes a big waving single, almost like a flag. And we're on to sugar kelp. This is a single blade on a short flexible stipe it's always a single blade but it can get very long and flowing or be quite short and compact it always has a ruched section in the middle and no midrib but you can see here this one's in a very sheltered area and it's almost become like some tissue paper or something it's utterly transparent and very big but it's still got that ruched section down the middle and if you were able to look at it properly, it would come to a point. It will be a single blade. Mostly present on a sheltered sediment seabed, but it needs rock to cling to. So here you can see these ones are clinging to various cobbles and pebbles. It won't sit in plain sand. So if you see it in sediment, you could usually shove your hand down into it and find what it's hanging on to. and when it gets very big it just lays flat across the seabed in the direction the current was last going so you can see these are huge long blades here maybe sort of 15 feet long just lying in straight lines across the seabed that's off Aaron. i haven't got a fantastic picture of dabalox but that doesn't matter because it's the only native kelp with this massive midrib down the middle and it stands out really nicely there's one invasive one that grows in marinas but you don't need to worry about that so this is the only native one with a midrib and it likes to live in very exposed areas on reef tops and it has a a fairly normal hold fast like a claw 
which it clings to the rock with, and then its reproductive structures are sort of strap-like shapes coming out of the sides of the stipe just below the main blade. So like fat cat's whiskers or something. And again, it's a single pointed blade up to two meters long, which is very thin and almost transparent. So it looks delicate, but it isn't. It's very tough because it has to put up with a lot of wave action. And the midrib is a continuation of the stipe. This is a photo that Charlotte took in a rock pool and you can just about see the beginning of the stipe and it works its way up through the thing and just down here there's the little bits of the, the weird reproductive sort of tatters below the main thing. So the stipe is very short and very flexible again because it's got to put up with being wanged over from one side to the other by fierce waves. <sighs> Still on kelp, furbelows, Saccharisa polyshides. Now in this first picture we've got the whole plant, so we've got the hold fast down here and then a very wriggly flexible bit of the stipe. The stipe is like a flat belt and then the main blade is a big mess of straps. So prefers very exposed locations again. Has a bul bulbous hold fast which Often looks like testicles. This one's clearly been punctured or something. And then the ruffled section we just saw in the main picture at the base of the very flat stipe, it's not round at all. And then a blade with at least eight fingers coming off it. You can see the very flat stipe there. And it is massive, four meters high. And hooray, we finished kelps. So a couple of extra browns that live a bit deeper. Landlady's wig, wig. <laughs> Landlady's wig, Desmarestia. There are at least three species in the UK and the differences between them are quite small and they all change dramatically from spring to autumn. They lose and gain a lot of branches and things. So best to stop at Desmarestia to start with until you get used to them. I know what's missing from this. I'll go through these bullet points and I'll say some extra things. So finely branching thin twigs, nice golden brown. Stick at the genus name because it's a bit too complicated. They tend to sit around just below the kelp zone in exposed areas on the east coast. They tend to be firmly attached to rocky walls just below the kelp. And then in the, the locks and things, they're just sitting around in unattached sort of big pillows lying around on the, the sloping silt below everything else. Often have bryozoans and nudibranchs attached and all kinds of interesting mollusks. These ones have got a few feather stars sitting around on them. Oh, hang on, I'm just gonna go back. Finish talking about that. Okay, the interesting thing I haven't managed to write down here is if these are upset in any way, they give off enormous amounts of acid. Is it sulfuric or nitric? I'm not, I thought it was sulfuric, but I'm yeah, not entirely I think, sure. I think it's sulfuric. So if you're into collecting seaweeds, never put this one in a bag with any others, because by the time you get back to shore, you'll just have a big brown soup in your collecting bag. They absolutely dissolve them. But on the plus side, um, you can use them to make pretty pictures on concrete and rocks. If you just spread them out on a piece of fairly grubby concrete and leave them for a day, the acid burns into the, the concrete and etches it in the pattern of the seaweed. And it's pretty cool. I'm just to see what this chat is. Ah, thank you, Louise. Sulfuric. <laughs> uh, I think I thought sulfuric because I think not only is it hazardous to other seaweeds, mm -hmm but it can give off Poison the gas. gases of de decomposition, which I think might be sulfur monoxide, or is it dioxide? I so, think it's dioxide, isn't yeah, it? So yeah. I think it's a non-odorless, mm. sorry, it's an odorless but toxic gas. Is that what almost killed, what's his name in his car? It's Fergus. Yes. I think it might have been. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> okay, this, there are lots of small browns, but this one's quite important to learn, Dictyota dichotoma, because it has a biotope all of its own. When there's a lot of it about, there's a really, really specific biotope that applies to this. Um, it sits below the kelps, mixed in with all the red algae. And it's a really nice, neat little thing. Very flat, neatly dividing into two every time. And the blades have very rounded tips like lolly sticks. It's very soft and flexible as well and just waves around in the current. It's, it's a, a lovely, tidy little thing. And there are other flat browns, but none are nice and neat like this. Mostly they have very raggedy ends and sort of dirty marks all over them and things. This one stands out quite well from the crowd. And we're on to greens. So, sea lettuces. This is probably the scene you imagine if you think of, of ulvas. So a nice big field of sea lettuce, ulva lactuca, something everybody's familiar with, kind of thing you learn at school. It's not that simple. So they actually live from the intertidal to down below the kelp. There are many different kinds of ulva. Uh, they're mostly in green ribbons and sheets. This one on the right here, Looks just like Ulva lactuca, but this is Ulva rigida. So it looks almost identical, but when you feel it, it's incredibly tough. It's like cellophane. It's very hard to tear. And there's a continuum of widths. So there's two or three of the very narrow species mixed in together here. And it looks nothing like the nice wide flat one. So it's a thing worth bearing in mind that if you're not absolutely sure, just stick it over. It's generally, the sheets are generally one cell thick, so they're very transparent and thin. Oh, and that's all I've got to say about it. Oh, we have another chat, sorry. Uh, now the newly shorn puppy needs to be uplifted. <coughs> Bye. Good luck, Steve. <laughs> okay, our next green, rootweed. Cladophora species. Generally subtidal. I don't think I've ever seen these intertidally. There are at least 16 UK species. I can't tell any of them apart. Not unless I've got two very clear examples next to each other. So stick at clad Cladophora unless you decide to make this your specialism. Yeah. Finely branched filaments made of long, thin cells in chains. So long, thin rectangles stuck one on top of the other end to end. Quite nice to look at under the microscope. And then we're on to Ketomorpha, which doesn't branch at all. So unbranching filaments. And they're made of chains of brick-shaped cells that you can actually see if you hold the thing up to the sunlight. You can see the little brick shapes. There are at least three similar UK species, so again, stick at Ketomorpha until you're reasonably happy with them. I think one is found in brackish water only, so you've only got two to choose from. Now we're galloping ahead, we're on to the red algae now. Okay, so this may not, not look much like a red seaweed, but this is a calcareous seaweed, pink encrusting algae, sitting on a rock. So it's absolutely rock hard. Often if you try to chip it off, you'll break more of the rock than you do of the algae. Incredibly tough stuff. And it's smooth paint-like stuff it can be knobbly it can have projections and there are many many species most of which cannot be identified in the field so you may have an older book that gives you very specific names for them it'll be wrong honestly this rock's got at least three different species on it and probably 
they're having a wild time where they actually intermingle their cells and you can have two or three species making up one apparent crust, which is really great fun. And it, it can be used as an important thing to identify a kind of biotope. So it's often, it often indicates either really high exposure or heavy urchin grazing. When you get urchin barrens where they've eaten everything they can and only the pink encrusting algae is left because they don't really like it. And here's red encrusting algae. So if you've been putting this on your form instead of pink, stop it. So this is just like a seaweed blade that's been pounded hard against the rock. So it makes a kind of paint. So it's soft red to almost black. It comes in lots of different shades because there are lots of different species that it could be. So again, we stick at red encrusting. You can scratch it with your fingernail. It is soft. It's not hard like the pink stuff. And you want to give it a quick poke to make sure it's not a sponge or a squirt. So it's not spongy or gelatinous. And it's the, the other half of the life stage of one of the many big leafy red seaweeds. So this is one of the very different life stages. And for us, it would be almost impossible to tell which one it was from. Before we go on, mm -hmm. do we get any brown encrusting or are, is sort of the range from obvious red to black all actually red? That's all red, but there, you, there, is, there is a range of brown encrusting algaes as well. Well done. <laughs> so if you see a bright golden brown thing, just like the red encrusting algae on a rock, then that's brown encrusting algae. Uh, there's only a few of those, so if you see a patch that's more than a foot across, then that is definitely the other half of Cutlaria multifidata. Cutler's many cleftweed, I think it's called. Um, so you could actually get that one to species. That's the only crust I know that you could get to a species. And there are a few other browns as well, so if you get little small patches, you'd just put brown encrusting. So now we're on to Merle, and Merle's great because its common name and its scientific name are exactly the same. So this is a free living version of the pink encrusting algae. It's lots of little tiny pieces, um, which can be sort of anything from tiny twiglets to big knobbly plates, as long as they're free living and not wrapped around anything. It's pink or purple coloured when it's alive, and that's the thin skin of live material spread over its, its white calcareous skeleton. So when it's dead, it's, it's sort of white or brown. You can see the stuff down here at the very bottom. That's dead merle. It's merle gravel. And then above it in the same picture, there's some live, which is still pink. And when you see a merle bed, if you can, make a rough estimate of what percentage is pink and alive. So 50% so live, 10% live. That's really handy to know. And you may find that it changes across your dive. If you swim up a slope from 16 to 10, you may start with all live and finish with all dead with a changeover in the middle. And so you might want to show that on your diagram. So I said, forms both a biotope and a seabed type when it's dead. And then we had to make another slide because I had so much to say about Merle. So this is in Loch Sween. You can see this is really big knobbly stuff. Don't attempt to get to species with this. Um, there are at least three species. They do look quite different, but like everything else, they will grow in wildly different forms to suit where they are, where the currents are different, the tides are different, different light levels will all affect how they grow. So we just stick at Merle for all of these now. I think that's largely because of developments in DNA typing. Mm -hmm. People used to be very confident that you could identify 
different kinds of merle and i think even four years ago we we did slides of the two different types but i think recently we've lost confidence because effectively it's pointed out they're different growth forms mm. and not necessarily different species yes mm -hmm. and this is scottish narrows for those who fancy a swim so <clears throat> if you've got live stuff it needs to go in your species list and your seabed cover type under other and you'll have to list it as merle bed if it's alive and if it's dead then it becomes a seabed type gravel or pebbles depending on the size of the pieces now on to coral weed coralina officinalis and so this is a, a sweet little seaweed which is again calcareous but lives attached to things so it can be intertidal and shallow subtidal it's one that's very common in rock pools on rocky shores. It's made up of pale pink herring bones that feel crunchy when you pick them up. And you can see again, it's a calcareous skeleton. So you can see the white bits at the end where it's growing. So it puts down the calcium skeleton and then it grows a skin of live material over the top. And when it dies, this live material is lost and you just get left with tiny little white bones. <laughs> Midrib red, red algae. So the sea beach, Delicera sanguinea. This is really a really common seaweed. Everybody's seen this at least once on a dive, even if they didn't know what it was. Nice, simple shaped blades with a very stiff midrib and side veins, just like a, a terrestrial leaf. Slightly transparent, they're very thin, the blades. And when it gets a bit older, the edges tend to go a bit wavy, but they still retain their simple shape. So if you are able to flatten it out, it would still be a leaf shape. It's not lobed at all. It's just wavy around the edges. Very common on kelp stipes and as an understory plant. So just below the kelp line, you get meadows of this kind of stuff. All exposures again. And this picture is one that's been up in the shallows through a, a fairly sunny part of the year and it bleaches bright yellow. And you can see how transparent it is in this picture too. And then just for comparison, this is the other very obviously mid-ribbed red, Picodrus rubens, and this is the other sea oak. So this is one we'd prefer to have that common name. And you can see it is sort of lobed and wriggly like oak leaves. So it has a midrib and side veins again, but the midrib is very soft and flexible. You see it's made of the same material as the blade. It's just a shaped bit. It is not cartilaginous. And the blade is very, very variable, it can be lobed. Um, you see when it's tiny, even it's, it's got some lobes growing around the edges. It's never simple and smooth. And when it's in very sheltered conditions, you get this freaky form, which is just the veins. So the midrib and the veins and almost all of the the blade flesh is absent. And again, this has been up in the shallow, so it's, it's bleached quite a bright yellow. And the first time I saw this, I couldn't believe it was the same kind of seaweed because it just looked nothing like. Yeah, very common on kelp stipes and in the understory, this and the, the sea beach often grow together. And then the third mid ribbed one is northern toothweed. Oh, we have another chat. Hang on. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, Mike's saying he didn't know it was the same, same species. It's weird. Oh, brilliant. So poor Aaron has lots of it. Oh, now you know what it is. <laughs> okay, so Northern Toothweed, 
another nice shiny one. The midrib on this, so it's, it's got a, a 2D sort of ferny shape. Shiny and smooth with an indistinct midrib. You can just about see it down the middle there. Sometimes it's a bit clearer than that. And sharply toothed edges to the blades. Gets to about 30 centimetres long and they usually grow in big bunches. All exposures, I've seen it pretty much everywhere up north and it comes down about as far as Yorkshire and then it stops dead. We don't get it at all. Again, you can see a vague hint of the midrib down here. The only thing it's likely to be mistaken for, it's common on kelp stipes, you could mistake it with Membranoptera alata. But you can see this has an odd growth form where it sort of alternates either side of the midrib. So it always looks a bit lopsided and weird. And it's not toothed, it's just slightly wriggly. So there's none of those sharp teeth on it. And this grows a little bit smaller, I mean, eight to 20 centimeters. And this is the best picture I could find because I don't see this, so we had no pictures of it. But it, I think that it's quite common on the East Coast, this one. Okay, and now onto no midribs. Red rag, Stilcia carnosa, a nice obvious one. Like a sheet of bright red leather, if you've got good visibility, you can see this from miles away. It really stands out from the surrounding seaweeds. Blade gets to about 50 centimetres high and it starts splitting up into lobes as it gets to a reasonable size. It comes from a very tiny hold fast. It's almost like a pinhead. Hardly believe it keeps it attached. There's only one similar species, which is called something like starry liverweed, but you're very unlikely to see that, so you can be reasonably confident of what you've got, that it is red rags. And it's surprisingly happy in all exposures. I mean, you'll see this on sort of bedrock walls in a hurling current. I don't know how it hangs on, because it's, it's a big flappy sheet with such a tiny attachment point. Chondrus crispus. Irish moss. Another nice tidy one. This is hugely variable. Um, it can be sort of a multitude of heights and widths and have really long or short stipes, but it always branches dichotomously, that's into two, to form a neat fan shape. Uh, you can just about see in this picture, it's often iridescent at the tips. You've got a good blue light coming off it. So this is the one that people often mistake for peacock, is it peacock fanweed? Mm. The Dracaella, because somebody put that in the first ever Sea Search ID book, and that's actually quite a rare plant, whereas this is really common. Smooth, featureless blades, which are rarely red. This is a red algae, but even when it's brand new, it's brown at best. And once it, it's been in a sunny place for any length of time, it's almost a fluorescent greeny yellow. It really bleaches hard. This one's sort of quite an orangey colour. Very, very tough and cartilaginous. It's really hard to get a good sample of it because it will not let go of the rock and it's really hard to break it. Happy in all exposures and in low salinity, but it will grow in wildly different shapes to suit its conditions. Here's a whole plant that's been picked. You can see, again, it's got a very tiny hold fast that comes to a point, but it still grips like anything. And then you see the nice, neat fan shape that it branches into. Cone weed. This is quite a common seaweed. And again, there are now three very, very similar species. So we always used to say Plocamium cartilaginum, but now we know there are three, so we stick at Plocamium. At least that's easier to remember. Nice bright red seaweed, very branchy, 
and make sort of flat ferny looking blades again which grow in quite dense bunches. The final blade tips only branch on one side and then those only branch on one side as well. So you get these things that look like big fat combs from the 1970s. And this is a thing you can easily see if you just put a bit flat on your finger. Even I can see it and my eyesight's dreadful now. It can be the dominant species in the understory, so just below the kelp zone, you can get great meadows of this and it happily grows on other seaweeds, so it will blanket out an area if it's happy. And this group, ceramiums, are very finely branching ones, often very small, but they can grow up to about 20 centimetres long, some of the rock pool species. But you can see the very nondescript, just little tiny branching reds that could be anything. But if you have a close look, you'll be able to tell them apart a bit more easily. So the main stem and all of the branches are banded in either red and pink or red and white, like the, the stockings on the housekeeper in Tom and Jerry cartoons. And this is on the end of my finger, and so you can see the stripes quite easily in daylight. But the easiest thing to do, if you're like me, is to take a photo and then zoom in so you can have a really good look and then you'll see these stripes and then you'll also see that the last pair of branches end in pincers and some people say they look like love hearts but I think they definitely look like evil claws coming to get you or chicken feet. Uh, and there are many species of this there's probably about 25 and of that 25 24 do this thing at the end and one doesn't but it still has the stripy legs so you're in with a good chance i've heard it's tim burton's favorite seaweed <laughs> my lovely assistant is still in the room <laughs> i have value <laughs> no <laughs> okay this is one people have trouble believing is a red seaweed. This is lava or porphyra. So many species again. This is this is just going to become my phrase. Impossible to tell apart. Stick at the genus level. Stick with porphyra to start with. And if you're me, stick at it forever. Transparent brown or pink sheets. Pardon me. <laughs> Which when they're out of the water dry like cellophane they go absolutely transparent and they sort of stick down onto the rocks and sort of vacuum pack it and it, they look absolutely dead as soon as the water comes back in they lift off rehydrate and are absolutely fine again uh, they found it all exposures and they can be anywhere from the intertidal to very deep water There's lots of different species one for every niche and they look horrible in real life <clears throat> but if you press them they, they make a very beautiful transparent pressing with all kinds of, sort of creases and 3d features really really pretty oh my god we're nearly at the end of this section yeah. my favorite common name because it's so long and awful beautiful eyelash weed Caliblepharis ciliata and you should be able to work this one out from all the others because it's so ridiculously hairy and spiky. So oval blades up to 30 centimeters high and they soon start to split up like go faster flames on a, a souped up car. And the blade edges have outgrowths and the outgrowths have outgrowths and by the end of the season the blade faces have outgrowths with outgrowths on them because every time <clears throat> they get knocked or damaged slightly, they grow an outgrowth. And so if they're somewhere really exposed or in a bit of wave action, by the end of the season, they just look like frantic red hedgehogs. They're just completely covered in little spikes and lumps. Generally at or below the kelp zone, and they like to sit along the top rails of wrecks. 
if you've got a nice shallow wreck, the top edge generally covered in this flapping away, covering itself in more spikes. Happy in all exposures, uh, about 30 centimetres high and a good clump can be about a metre across. It's a pretty big plant. And we are done. We're on to the joy of pressing. Oh, we put the extra slides in, didn't we? We, we did. And I'll do those because Dawn's running out of voice <laughs> and struggling. So I don't I, talk much. So I prepared a strepsil for Thank her. <laughs> and, and she's being treated. So hopefully that'll stop her causing any more trouble. <laughs> oh dear, she's choked on a strepsil. <coughs> we'll have to be careful about that. Okay, so... This is the aftermath of a seaweed road trip we did in 2011, and that re-established a benchmark for the east coast of England. Um, because as far as we know, nobody had done a coherent study for about 100 years before that. And the reason I did this, or we did this, but it was my idea, was I'd been on a seaweed study trip to the Sillies and seen how even witless minions could press seaweed and I was particularly impressed that you can recover absolute ID from pressings and you can even recover genetic information from pressings done well so years they're later, years years decades maybe later so it's proper science to do seaweed pressing you can do it non-fatally um, and it's a great a, great sort of home study. Um, so let's tell you how to do it and encouraging, encourage you to do more. Um, not to speculatively grab handfuls of seaweed, but perhaps to selectively start bringing small samples home that you can press and identify properly with time to study. Okay. As I said, seaweeds can be saved very well, simply and attractively. And it was a great Edwardian, Victorian sort of creative pastime. You can press seaweeds, produce lovely scenes. And there's some, I mean, there's some lovely Victorian ones if you search online. And the Natural History Museum has some big displays, which are super. So when we say pressing, actually, it's not so much pressing as drying them flat. And so drying them on thick paper, which isn't going to fall apart during the process. And all you need is a tray, some thick paper, nappy liners and a drying press in inverted commas. Because you're just going to keep them pressed against the paper. You're not trying to wring them out or crush them. You're trying to press them against the paper so the natural kind of mucousy coating of the seaweed adheres them to the paper. Um, Labelling, again, I thought this is the kind of science you can do, is you can write on the paper using a pencil before you soak it, and it self-documents. It's an activity that you can keep up with. So here are some powerful, impressive looking scientific hands <laughs> doing seaweediness. And the idea is you slip the paper into the bottom of your tray, and then you float the seaweed on, and it can be a piece of paper cut to size. You don't have to use A3, A4, or any particular size for seaweed. You can cut your precious paper to suit. Um, and so you can spread it out if necessary, and it would overlap, you could clip pieces off. So you get a simple, flat, easy to see display. You can spread them out with either some tweezers or a paintbrush and ideally this is seawater because seawater won't chemically upset the sample. Um, there's a risk that um, fresh water will burst the cells because there'll be osmotic pressures. Um, so seaweed is best but if you're doing nice tough seaweeds for your own use and ID then not saving the genetic material then Fresh water's fine. Tap water is fine. The, the clever bit is over so soon that you'll, you'll wish you'd spent longer on it, really. 
once you have your seaweed arranged, you lift it up gently and draw the seaweed slowly out of the water so it breaks the surface tension of the main body of water and adheres to the paper as it comes out. And if it goes wrong, you can push it back in and do it again. It really isn't a one shot deal. And then you have your sample actually ready. There's it here, samples ready. That's Taonia amata, which Atomaria, we have, Atomaria, which we haven't covered here. And then the nappy liner comes in mm. because obviously if this stuff would stick to one piece of paper, you can't put another piece of paper on top of it in the press while you dry it. So you use a nappy liner, which is a non-stick breathable membrane over this one. And then you can stack up as many as you like. Um, I made a big pile of presses a long while ago just by sticking lots of 20, 25 millimeter holes in a matrix in pieces of plywood and then using ratchet straps around them. But that's because we were traveling and we needed even pressure, even though we were handling this pile of stuff and to stop them escaping. At home, you can stick them in under a pile of magazines. And I suppose I should have said, between them, you would stick sheets of newspaper. It's probably on the next diagram, isn't it? It may be, we may be done. No, no we're oh, done. Sorry, sorry. So there you are, I was right, you were wrong, ha ha. <laughs> um, so I should have said, if we're building our stack of seaweed samples, we'd put down a double layer of newspaper, two sheets of newspaper, our samples on top, they can share the space if they're small samples, nappy liner over them, two sheets on top, and start again with the samples until you've built up your stack of all your samples and then press them underneath something but you've got to change the paper over daily the newspaper over daily twice a day for the first two days oh twice a day otherwise it'll go moldy mm. and then your samples are knackered after a week they should be dry enough that they can then rest and you'd keep your your collection still separated by the nappy liners to stop them sticking to each other but then it could just be the sample sheets in a folder, in a wallet. And it's a nice way of having a local reference of your actual local species of seaweed. Because one of the things that several seaweed experts said to us is you need a local herbarium, a local atlas or reference, because growth forms are so different in different areas. And that's pressing, which is easy. Dawn asked me to mention taking pictures of seaweeds. And taking pictures of seaweeds is actually quite hard. Keep talking. Oh, we've got a chat coming in. Oh, <laughs> somebody's Googling nappy liners. Excellent, they're pretty good value. And you- I'm still on my first roll. Yep. Excellent, so taking pictures of seaweed. The problem with seaweed is it's designed to absorb light. So if you steam up to a piece of seaweed, often it'll come out far too dark. So either you need to effectively overexpose um, or put in massive quantities, more light than you'd expect so the camera can cope. Another chat. Oh, <laughs> that's someone with a flower press. Ooh, that will work. Yeah. Flower presses don't tend to have great ventilation, do they? No, is... If you change the paper often enough, that's fine. Yeah, they're a great press. They do the pressing bit really well. Maybe you'd have to be more careful about the, the paper changing because the, the moisture can't get out any other way. Excellent. The other thing that works well for seaweeds is rather than using flash, which you, I tell someone always <laughs> um, to use. <laughs> um, luckily, Kaz can't see that Dawn's just given her a, a, sing <laughs> a signal. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so another thing you can do is set your camera effectively to use ambient light, and then your camera will take a picture as you see it. 
because the cameras tend not to be that bright. With flash, the flash will disproportionately disappear and you'll get over dark pictures. So light is always the thing with seaweeds. Some, some are easier than others and certainly at depth, a seaweed is a thankless thing to take, to take pictures of. And also, seaweed pictures don't tend to be brilliant for ID because not, they can't always capture the details. I think we had a, a run last year, perhaps late in the year, of seaweeds from Scotland, which were very hard to ID. Mm, and yeah. so you want to think in the same way as you might do when you're pressing. Can you get the whole sample in to show what the seaweed looks like overall? Can you get close enough to look at the particular ID features, which with seaweeds is particularly the hold fast and the apices, the points on the end. And if you are lucky to separate the stipe and the blade, um, and by that time, you've, you've used most of your dive on one <laughs> on one example. But lots of pictures are good. Experiment with what works. I think some of the nicest habitat pictures are of seaweed sort of acting in the current with sun pouring through it. And it's a great way to use those sort of last few minutes whilst you're off gassing or you really don't want to come out is getting the perfect picture of a piece of seaweed. And if you've built up a bit of animosity against your dive buddy, it's a great way of cheesing them off as well. Especially if they need a wee. Especially if they need a wee, <laughs> their hands are frozen, and, and they've already had a rough dive because you've been taking pictures of stuff. Um, I should say a bit about collecting seaweeds. Okay, go on then. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> when you collect seaweeds, you don't want to pick them like flowers. So you don't want to sort of take off half a branch you want to get a whole individual. So look amongst your, your seaweed clump and find one that looks fairly typical and reasonably small and try to scrape the whole thing off the rock so that you get all of the hold fast as well as the stipe. <coughs> and we're lucky down here because all of ours grow on chalk or flint so I can scrape them off with my thumbnail. But if you're on really hard, complicated rock, you might need to take something like a butter knife down with you to get underneath it. Um, that done, you take your sample, your typical seaweed, and you shove it in a plastic bag or a net bag that you've got with you. And you just collect, say, four or five on your dive so that you can really think about what you've got when you get back. You've got plenty of time to look at them. And you probably photograph them <clears throat> in a white tray as well so that you you can ask people on the internet what on earth you've got and then you want to take a picture of the whole thing with a ruler next to it and then close-up pictures of the hold fast and the stipe and the blade and the very tips to show how pointed or not they are and if you've got something like placamium or ceramium you want to take a really good macro picture as well and then you can press it and then find out what it is later. Excellent. Dawn mentioned net bags and plastic bags. Obviously everybody hates plastic, but it's very functional. Um, and Ziploc plastic bags um, can keep your samples in one place. They have the advantage that you collect your pressing sample water at the same time. Mm -hmm. They have the disadvantage that they're heavy because you're bringing back water at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how far you walk. Um, I've never seen a professionally created net bag. They've always been beautifully artisan created from old curtains. I think Charlotte bought one. Oh, <laughs> I thought she made them. Anyway, the net bags <clears throat> are nice. They're soft, or they should be soft, because you don't want to damage your samples. Um, they keep them collected. It's easier to make them drawstring. So getting samples in and out is less of an issue. Yes, having them fire themselves back out of the plastic one is always irritating. Yeah, so obviously if you push a quantity of stuff into a plastic bag and then squeeze it before you shut it, it will just <laughs> squirt them out again. And that's the advantage of net bags in that they shed water through them and you aren't left carrying a couple of kilos of yeah. water up the beach. And when we say net bag, like a net curtain, not like a normal diving net bag, Yes, yes, that sort of thing. Mike says net bags for washing delicates, that kind of thing. 
yeah. the really fine ones. That's why we don't know anything. Yeah, we don't Who's... have any delicates. Well, <laughs> well, speak for yourself. <laughs> but I think the thing is that we we have a staff to do our washing for us. <laughs> you told me we still had staff. So anyway, that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that's the main body over so people can unmute themselves mm. if, if you'd like to talk and ask questions and things. Good, we actually, we've done really well, haven't we? We have. We were <laughs> worried this would be over long. It's been pretty dense, um, but hopefully people enjoyed it. We'll unmute our camera. Uh, oh, we'll unstop sharing and go back. Oh, same spirit as net venture bags would work well as they have a drawstring, says Carola, says Kaz, and Louise offers that Lakeland has them, and Lakeland also have Penrith Fudge. <laughs> Which is cheaper than at the Penrith Fudge shop. It is, and it's not as frightening either, because the Penrith Fudge lady is really hostile. Yes, <laughs> she is. Okay. And... We're back in the room. Oh, we will be in a moment. We're back. Look at this glowing contingent of happy people. <laughs> Excellent. So if anybody's got any questions, fire away. No, they're all still muted. Brilliant, let's go. <laughs> Run. <laughs> no, go on. I'll throw another at you. Um, so with the species where they're quite similar and there's multiple, there's multiple um, species within a genus, and you're saying just put blah blah SP. Yeah. Oh, how do we? Is. How do we? How do we? If we get ambitious, <laughs> get beyond that. So where are some of those SPs? For example, my crude way of doing it is so I'll I'll do a dive. I'll come back. I'll have I've got some photographs. I'll have looked at them closely while I'm on the dive. I'll get my seaweed book out and I'll flick through, and I'll think. It looks like that one. Oh, and then I look at the distribution map and it says Isle of Man and the others don't. So I go, oh, well, it must be that one then. Is but it actually, the it, it, might, it might be the first <laughs> record of another one for the Isle of Man. It could well be. Is it the sea search book you're looking at the distribution maps in? Yes. Don't. <laughs> it's what it's book not should I, great. What book should we use? For the distribution well, look, maps. The sea search book is great for ID, but the distribution maps are not very accurate. So okay. don't assume if something doesn't appear there, don't assume it doesn't actually grow there. Yeah. The the embarrassing reason for that is the sea search book doesn't use the sea search distribution maps. No, it uses some old ones from about 1926. I think they come <laughs> from the MBA. No, they're before that even. Okay. They're so rubbish. The best Lara has just said what I was going to say. So well done, Lara. <laughs> it's cheated me out of sounding like I know anything. Uh, Lara's pointed out the NBN Atlas is a real atlas of distribution. It contains the sea search information that the book should have used mm -hmm. and other people's information as well. So it is a consensus atlas of distribution. I mean, as to working through deeper ID, and that's exactly what you'd do with your samples or would you with your excellent photos mm. is you can go to your books and then differentiate on the basis of key ID features. Um, it has to be said, I mean, seaweed ID is complicated. And even when I did a seaweed ID course, there was an element of going through the key, finding one you thought it was and then working backwards <laughs> from the result you thought you had to see if it validated mm. um and it was hard most of the good keys are long out of print yes but there's also this the the id groups on facebook as well and you put your photos on there and say i think it's x and then somebody else will come in and say does it have these features could it be this other thing so it, you get a good chat going and either you get to your specific species or you find that you can't do it from what you've got. And next time you go in, you get a slightly different sample or you take different pictures. Wise words, mate. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's a thankless task. Um, Sometimes it's good. Don't take any notice. Well, no, it, it, is, it <laughs> is good, but it is a very complicated task. I thought... I mean, before I went on that trip, which inspired the road trip, 
Um, but I had a handle on the, some of the basics, things like um, the, the sea lettuces, <laughs> uh, the alvas. <laughs> and on the way back, I'd made great friends um, with an alva expert who could tell by touch the difference mm. between some of them. And she said, oh, have this new book. And there were 60 alvas. And you thought, hmm, that's a degree of granularity I'm not easily going to be able to pick up. That requires study. But you'll often find that you're not always going to get all those species in your locality. Mm. It's worth an effort to I mean, pick up the low hanging fruit, the easier species, and then the exceptions will become more obvious. But yeah, it's an iterative process that you have to work on. Mm. And the, there are sea search courses as well. I mean, this is just a really simple short thing, but uh, people like Lynn Baldock and Jenny Lum. Oh, sorry, Lum. No, oh, I've forgotten her name. Anyway, Lynn Baldock, Jane Pottis. Lots of people will do seaweed courses, and they would love to come to the Isle of Man. So, if you say I'd like a course here it would be quite an easy push to get them to come. Yeah, I mean, that's why we did our seaweed road trip. It was to organise an event interesting enough and significant enough to get worthwhile experts on. Um, and most of the ex, I mean, the community is very small. The experts like an excuse or even to be enabled to study new areas. So if you can sort them out an interesting itinerary um, and give them enough warning, they'll probably want to come. Excellent. Another question, please. <laughs> so the, the seaweeds that are ribbed, um, they've got, they've got the, the central rib. Uh -huh. are, are they, I mean, presumably it's not, not as straightforward as with the land plants with mon monocots and dicots. I mean, are they actually relate, are they actually related in any sort of evolutionary sense or are they, are they sort of dotted about between between um, genera? I, th I think they're pretty far apart, so I think it's convergent evolution. I think okay. they've just decided this works well, we'll have this shape. I, I don't think they're particularly closely related. Okay. Yeah. Seaweeds as a whole are almost kingdoms. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the browns are, almost, I mean, are pretty much a kingdom on their own, and a lot of the <laughs> A lot of the separation is for convenience, in that these are very different species which just happen to occupy similar niches. Um, so yeah, you'll find that they they aren't they aren't easy to categorise, which is why often some of the books group them by still group them by shape, mm. which really is Victorian era of biology. I mean, like like when worms and eels and snakes were all the same thing. Um, Things are just starting. The use of DNA is enabling separation, but in truth, that's just uncovering that things are a lot more complicated. And these shortcuts to aid just organization I mean, stand as ways of managing the problem whilst, whilst we all get tricorders. Um, you're not going to see many of the, the mid ribbed ones off Norfolk either. Uh, we get the Delos area, the sea beach, really occasionally, I think I've seen it maybe three times off Norfolk, but it's always been quite shallow, so you might have a chance. But the other two, the, the toothed one only gets down as far as Yorkshire, and I've not seen the, the sea oak, but I'm still hopeful of that. So what, is the, what is the biggest difference between the seaweeds that you get off Norfolk and the ones that you're seeing is, you know, you know, you've been, you dive kind of all the way up the coastline, say, when does that kind of change occur? It, like, do you notice anything gradual? Or? I think, I think it's quite a, a swap over and it's probably the seabed because we don't get any kelps at all. Yeah. And they just suddenly come in around Yorkshire. They're above Lincolnshire anyway, aren't they? Yeah. I think when we have a problem with turbidity and the temperature range, the temperature range and the solidity of our seabeds. So even if we did get the, the kelp growing on the chalk, it would rip off in the winter. 
um, it's dark for four to five months a year because of the turbidity and the temperature drops to nearly freezing inshore um, during the winter and gets up to over 20. So it's, it's, a, it's a big difference from the relative stability and clarity in Scotland. Um, and that seems to be a split. And I think the water becomes clearer as you go up the east, but it's probably not until Northumberland that it's properly clear, properly <laughs> prolonged clear. And then it probably varies with parts, because I know that some of the northern, like the Durham coasts, can be I mean, extremely thick. But they do get kelp there. Hmm. Yeah, I think the coast itself there is recovering because they had lots of industrial damage. Mm, that's true. And they, they, the thing, things like that seem to be encouraging quite well, recovering quite well. But yeah, I, I guess there's a, a changeover. Um, I think that's a colder coast, isn't it? And then the west is more stable. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we should come and have a look. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep coming north. You could come up to Orkney now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems like an offer of free accommodation, I think. It did. Free accommodation <laughs> yeah. and, and, and ferries. And uh, for everyone's <laughs> <to> go. <Yeah. laughs> Excellent. It, it would be really nice to do similar events because the, the, the lack of, I guess, sort of baseline surveys does give rise to these funny distribution maps mm -hmm. that people weirdly stick to like articles of faith um, when you find that actually they're not true or maybe they're not true anymore mm. and there was I mean, quite a drive on recording probably in the 90s and lots of the ideas have stuck around there I mean, there's a, a really good cohort of people I guess doing government and government sponsored science, which has died off and it's now more, much more functional recording rather than speculative and broad spectrum recording. So it's all down to us. <laughs> Excellent. I see Trevor's unmuted. Are you, are you, do you have a thing to say Trevor? Uh, no, I just unmuted, that's all. Oh, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. No, lovely to hear your voice, Trevor. So I missed you last time I was up. Yeah, we've just had Tim up again. Action. No, we, we'll return so long as, as soon as it's safe and midge-free for us soft-skin southerners. Oh, you, you've uh, timed it wrong with there because the midges are only just starting. Mm. Yeah, we had a, had a big... A big pink friend of ours went up and got eaten to pieces. <laughs> <It's hilarious. laughs> so I think, yeah, one day I'll be brave enough to come during mid season. But at the moment, I'm I'm probably looking at September. Warmest time of the year. Mm. Excellent. Any other questions? I don't don't want to keep people trapped here too long because you are free to go. You have lives of your own, and you are allowed to go. Um, so. Any more questions? Oh, apparently not. Well, I think this is this is this has been a lovely evening. Um, Dawn was very worried she had to sort of work just worked up this this presentation, um, and so I'm very proud of her. <laughs> <laughs> Oof! Ah. Um, Louise says thanks very much. Thank you very much, Louise, for coming. A really good turnout. And since I've remembered to record this, we'll put it online. But really, I mean, it's like, cat, well, what's the best book for seaweed? You say, well, lots of them. And most of these, you want a variety of sources. You want to keep topping up your, your expertise, stealing other people's expertise. Um, because, I mean, even, even a really good sort of practiced seaweed idealist, it'll, it'll just fade away with a, a season's neglect. So you need to keep it up. So thanks ever so much for having us into your homes and hope to see you around. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. That was brilliant. Yeah.